Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you might be on planet Earth. And welcome to the August 16th episode of Let's Get Sassy. This is your one-stop shop for everything sassy from your friends at Cisco. I'm John, and I'll be your sassy MC for this episode. Today's episode might be our most important yet, sassy and zero trust. With threats closing in on your business from every angle, zero trust frameworks can help to keep the good guys in and the bad guys out. Zero Trust helps us secure every user to every application every time. There's nothing more important in the world of security than securing your crucial data and your customers' personally identifiable information. Zero Trust makes that possible. So buckle up. But first, the news. Welcome back to the Let's Get Sassy news segment. We're glad you made it. In today's acquisition news, Cisco has announced it has acquired Code BGP, a privately held BGP monitoring company based in Greece. The Code BGP team consists of renowned BGP experts who will enable Cisco Thousand Eyes to expand its BGP monitoring capabilities and global authoritative view of internet health. The addition of Code BGP to the Thousand Eyes team will enrich our already accomplished pool of internet research and engineering talent enabling us to increase our BGP monitoring capabilities and pace of innovation so we can accelerate our customers' troubleshooting and optimization efforts in delivering the best possible digital experience to our users. This week in our content creator spotlight, we invite you to check out the Cisco Secure Channels. These exist in Facebook, Instagram, X, and LinkedIn, and are your single online source for all things security at Cisco. There are product highlights, interviews with security professionals, and great customer spotlights highlighting all the great things going on in the world of Cisco security. Check it out today. In this week's Talos segment, I want to concentrate on the Talos Half Year in Review. The Talos Half Year in Review is a recap of the top threats and security trends so far in 2023. From new ransomware groups, a growing mercenary space, espionage campaigns, supply chain attacks, and new as-a-service tools popping up, there's a lot to talk about already in the first half of 23. Check it out. Should be a good watch or read. And now would be the time, as we like to do, to remind you to hit that like, subscribe, and notification bell so that you can be assured you will never miss an upcoming episode of Let's Get Sassy. So let's get down to the main event. Sassy and Zero Trust from Cisco. To dig into this great subject, I want to introduce first-time host Rasika. She's got a special guest today for today's discussion. Take it away, Rasika. Welcome back to Let's Get Sassy. I'm your host, Rasika Chaudhary, and today we are going to dive into one of the most important and revolutionary concept in cybersecurity, which is zero trust. We have a fantastic industry expert, Oscar, who is going to share his valuable insights, experiences, and best practices to help you understand how Zero Trust can transform your organization's security approach. Thanks for joining me here, Oscar. We are thrilled to have you here. To begin with, Oscar, can you explain me Zero Trust in a simple terms uh, for our audience, especially for those who might be new to this concept? Well, hello, Rasika. Mm -hmm. And first of all, uh, that's a great question. And, and thanks for having me and for the opportunity to talk about this big topic uh, now. So uh, allow me first to mention that uh, Zero Trust is not a solution. It's not an, a specific product or a magic box. Zero Trust is more like a model, right? That is based on the principle of never trust on anything, uh, but always verify. It can be based on procedures, solutions, tools, people. But the premise here is to never trust but always verify. Thanks for such a concise and clear explanation. So Oscar, can you tell me why Zero Trust has gained so much momentum in cybersecurity landscape? Like what's driving its adoption? Well, uh, considering that the threat landscape and the attack surfaces of, of the organizations are increasing due to the adoption of strategies like cloud computing, hybrid work, and others, 
I will say that the challenge to apply zero trust on them is keeping the organizations looking for new ways to protect their assets and their individuals. It is a, indeed a buzzword right now, zero trust, and there are a lot of companies doing it differently. And what I believe that it's driving its adoption, it's the never decreasing need to minimize risk in the over organization overall, you know? Absolutely, like zero test adaptability to modern IT environments is impressive. Uh, and I mean, we know that zero trust is something that we cannot just buy off the shelf, right? So what kind of core principles and components we should be looking at? Well, that's a great one. Uh, from my perspective, what you need to do is to consider for consider four steps to to it uh, or to zero trust, which are establish trust first, uh, and that means that uh, the user or device or service identity, you will need to create posture and context based verifications, on um, risk based authentication as well. Uh, you will need to enforce trust-based access, uh, for example, that's the second uh, point. And for that, you will need to use micro-segmentation whenever possible. You will need to unify your access control and adopt the least privilege principle of par as part of your strategy. And third, you will want to use continuous trust verification, and that means that you will need to reassess your trust, identify the indicators of compromise or the indicators of attacks, and also identify the tactics, the techniques, and the um, the procedures that the attackers are doing. Uh, use shared signals between products and people. That's that's very important. Leverage threat intelligence tools, for example, or or sources. Uh, do behavior monitoring or on threat and non-threat activity. And finally, implement vulnerability management. And that's it for that point. And finally, uh, to complete the four-step procedure we will need to respond to changes in trust, okay? So once uh, something is identified that it's deviating the, the behavior uh, that of what we consider trust, then we will need to prioritize, for example, what it's the incident response, orchestrate the remediation and, and use uh, integrated plus open workflows, right? Well, it's fascinating to see how all these elements come together to create a robust security framework, right? But there are some organizations that they're still using the legacy system. So Oscar, can you tell me how can this organization basically transition to zero trust without any disruptions to their operations? And yes, uh, that's that's very important. And, and what I will say is that uh, we can leverage defense in depth on a layered security approach, and those are principles of security, right? And we, we can start with visibility, then, like I said in the in the previous question, we can use micro-segmentation, we can understand the behavior and be able to detect DBA deviations of those systems with network anomaly detection uh, solutions. We can always determine uh, how those systems are going to be authenticated and unauthorized and what happens when they break the, their security checks or posturing, right? So we, we, will, we will want to, to create a specific attack surface in which those, those systems are going to be. And, and in that specific surface, we will position tools, procedures, and elements that are going to be uh, kept in there so that we can uh, protect and create a zero trust model around those legacy systems. That's an excellent advice. <laughs> Moving on, uh, talking about user productivity here, that's always a significant concern for many organizations, right? When talking about implementing the stringent security measures, right? Now, how this organization can balance security with user experience in zero trust environment? Can you tell more about this? Well, when, when looking for the balance between security and the user experience, I, I read a, a Forbes article that touched some points that I believe that are good enough when, when looking for that balance. So allow me to explain a little bit about them. So first, I will say that we can deliver on the expectation of, of the good user experiences, right? So what that means is that we've made things easy for ourselves. 
uh, which I feel that has made us more demanding. People today want things now and expect them to work, and that can be buggy, right? So we we will want to test the the tools, the procedures, the uh, user experience be before launching a tool or launching launching a solution or launching an overall procedure to the end user so that we can verify that the user is going to be uh, having a streamlined experience without any any problems or any complexity around that and secondly we we won't we don't want to make security an option we want to make security essential so what that means is that I believe that the organizations that want to ensure security while enabling usability should create solutions that are secure by default. So, for example, we want to make sure that the systems are designed for security within them rather than bolting onto them and have encryption automatically turn it on, right? So, we, we want to leverage all the possible uh, characteristics of the the design that we can uh, use inside the building of the solutions instead of uh, tying something external into the uh, system. If we don't, we don't have any other choice, then we certainly we will need to use a th external solution and, and make security part of that solution as well. But we want to first leverage uh, the security by design instead of uh, using a third party solution and thirdly uh, and that this this one kind of explains by itself and it's to use uh, password managers and two factor authentication that's going to protect the identity and of course the data that it's uh, behind the identity or the systems that the identity is trying to access and and finally appreciate the the user workflow and assess the risk, right? So to understand usability, you have to appreciate that uh, what people are trying to do and make it easier for them. And that means that rather than giving them a lot of lots of tasks to do and decisions to make, make things simple. Uh, that's why the user interface design is so important. Uh, it's it's not only uh, related to the administrator uh user interface but also the end user uh experience overall and how that user it's feeling the complexity of the tools that they will need to use and enable and and follow uh so that they can be able to do their stuff and their task every day when designing security controls we can draw thick red lines around things that to keep people away but you can strike a better balance if you have an appreciation of what users are trying to do, what the risks are, and what can go wrong, right? Let's shift our guess for a moment here. So ever since pandemic has hit, right, we are seeing that increasing use of cloud services and uh, remote workforce, right? Uh, we know that remote work workforce is not going away anytime soon. So Oscar, can you tell me like how Zero Trust can help to address all the security challenges? Well, security is also part of the cloud services and, and remote work. So for example, for, for cloud services, uh, first you will need to understand what are your responsibilities according to the cloud model that you are using and that are, you are about to adopt, right? So that you can understand and identify the boundary between your responsibilities and the cloud provider. Once you have clear understanding of them, you start by doing a threat surface analysis and a business impact analysis, uh, threat modeling and risk-based analysis and vulnerability management and all of that stuff that we already know. And with them, uh, the priorities and the possible solutions, they are going to emerge, right? And, and it's the same for the remote worker. We need to determine the, the attack surface we need to determine the 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 risk uh, that it's associated with the with that surface, and also once once we we identify that we can do a business impact analysis and all of, and so on and so forth, so that we can identify the better solutions uh, and the best solutions that we can use in that uh, environment, right? But those are certainly 
uh, surfaces that nowadays uh, customers are like, uh, no, I don't, I won't, I don't want to say evading, but uh, they are certainly forgetting about them sometimes. So I would like uh, to mention that there, that's that's something very important to keep in mind, especially uh, the the cloud environments, because there's a misconception uh, that the cloud it's it's secure by default, which is not true. Well, exciting times for the cybersecurity landscape ahead. Uh, but anyway, before we conclude, I have one last question for you, Oscar, and I promise this is the last question. Uh, what advice would you give organizations uh, who are considering implementing zero trust, uh, but they don't know from where to start? Well, uh, for this final one, I will advise them to consider the following observations, right? So first, Zero Trust, it's an evolutionary framework, not a revolution. Zero Trust is not a technology, but a design approach. Zero Trust should augment other existing cybersecurity practices and tools rather than replace them. Uh, threat protection remains an important component of Zero Trust. Zero Trust is a mature strategy and will provide a positive return of investment, but it will require sometimes uh upfront investment depending on the current state of your organization and i want to thank everyone for for your attention and for participating in this uh in this uh event so thank you so much and have a great day uh thank you oscar for sharing your valuable insights on zero trust thank you everyone thanks Rasika. that was some awesome content so I think that's about all the time we have for today. I wanted to thank Rasika and Oscar for that information about Zero Trust. As a security professional and business owner, there's nothing more important than protecting your users, and Zero Trust gives you the ability to do just that. A SASE architecture with a Zero Trust framework is a great way to accomplish your security goals. If you have any questions about how Cisco can help you achieve your Zero Trust goals in a SASE architecture, reach out to your Cisco sales team. They can help you along in your journey to Zero Trust, no matter where you might be in that journey. Tune in next time for our season finale, where we have a special surprise for you, including guests and a great show. So until next time, I'm your sassy MC John. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you right here soon for the next episode of Let's Get Sassy. See you all soon.